Everybody, welcome to this episode of Elements to Elevate by 180 Elevate. Each month, we laser focus and dig deeper into an area of leadership by design, which we truly believe is an element to uplift our perspectives and humanity. From insights to action, the path to elevate your mind, body, and soul starts here. In today's episode about media now, our guest is Laura Richardson who is the Chief Marketing Officer of Crown Media Family Networks, home of three linear networks, Hallmark Channel, Hallmark Movies and Mysteries, and Drama. Welcome, Laura. I'd like to start by saying thank you to Crown Media for being the sponsor of our show today and supporting our mission of elevating leadership. A portion of the proceeds will go to your philanthropy of choice, and we honor your pledge to support Caleb and Calder so Sloan's awesome foundation. Welcome, Thank you Laura. So much. And yeah, of course. Thank you for being on our show. Mm -hmm. We are glad to have you on today. You have an incredibly elevated background across different functions and title. So take us on your journey from early career to this guru you are now that so many of us and future audience would look up to. We would love to hear about your key learnings and takeaways in each phase of your journey. Oh, thank you. Wow. Well, um, you know, it's been a twisted road. I think everyone's is right. It's there's no uh, no straight line forward. But, um, you know, growing up, I was uh, the child of a military uh, uh, father. So I did a lot of moving around. And I think that was really useful to me in my career because we all know sort of uh, life you need to be adaptable. <laughs> and I think I learned a, a lot of adaptation um, in that. But anyway, as a professional, um, I was really unsure what I wanted to do at first. Um, I changed my major like a million times in college. And um, I, I was a summer camp counselor uh, for a long time. And ironically, that led to my first uh, job in television. Um, I got a job producing a local kids show in Lubbock, Texas. Um, and uh, so that was a, a great experience for me. It was, uh, I'm aging myself a little, but it was way before computers. And, uh, you know, you kind of had to do everything by hand. And I learned a lot. I loved working in a, in a small market like that because I was able to get a lot of different kinds of experiences. Um, and then I moved into, I, I left Lubbock, Texas for Miami Beach, Florida, um, and worked for a division of USA Broadcasting. And uh, there I was a writer, producer in um, promotion and marketing and had a blast doing that. It was a really creative um, time in my life and a really fun time um, for me personally. And then um, the, the company shut down and that led to a move to New York City. And so I started working uh, for a women's network called Oxygen. Um, it was a startup network at the time. Uh, Oprah Winfrey was part of that. And so I, I just loved the um, initial uh, idea of, of what that meant. There weren't a ton of, you know, women-specific networks at the time. And I really enjoyed um, getting, getting into that process and getting on board with that network in its early days. Um, and then from there, I, I moved um, to Washington, D.C. and started working for uh, Discovery Channel. I worked for uh, TLC, another women's network at the time, and bounced around, went back to New York for a while, worked at History Channel. And then um, about a year ago, uh, I ended up uh, here at Crown Media, uh, working as the chief marketing officer for um, Hallmark Channel. So, um that's sort of a, a, a nutshell. <laughs> oh my gosh, I remember Oxygen and TLC, and I loved some of the shows. I cannot remember any one of those off the top of my head, but are they still on, or is, is, are those channels been shut down yes. since, since then? Yeah, both channels are still on. You, nice. um, So Oxygen is no longer owned by, um, by Oprah, but it really has uh, a wide variety mm. um, of shows that are still sort of skewed uh, towards women. And then uh, TLC is absolutely uh, alive and kicking. You probably remember it, um, What Not to Wear. That was a big show uh, <laughs> when I was working there. <laughs> so How fun. Yeah. That is incredible in terms of all the major cities in the U.S. you've lived from Miami Beach to New York to D.C. Now you're in L.A. 
Um, and so, you know, anything, what we always say is um, the only thing constant in this world is change. And so it sounds like right. what you went through, a sense of personal transformation every time you witnessed change, um, it led you to the next level in your career almost, right? And if you were staying still, it's not almost like you're staying still. You were taking a step backward in life. Um, do you agree with that philosophy, surely so, and how you've elevated yourself and progressed through different career phases, going into different cities, and not staying in one role or one place at a time? Sounds like that's the key to success. Totally agree with that. Um, like I said, I, you know, I'm just hearkening back to sort of the way I grew up, which was, you know, every two or three years, my, my dad was getting stationed in a new place. And so um, I kind of continued that, you know, as an adult, um, although I've lived here in L.A. for almost six years, which I think seven years is the longest I've ever lived anywhere. But I definitely feel like I'm, <laughs> I'm home now. <laughs> but um, but yes, I absolutely think that, you know, most of those places, you know, I moved to New York City. I did not know anyone there. I had no idea. Um, I mean, I I got a job and then moved, but I have moved before without having a job. So um, usually my job has led me to a location and I've been, um, you know, I think fortunate just to be able to, um, you know, have the, have the, um, courage to try it, you know, and to, and to always think about that sort of nothing is forever, right? You can always move somewhere else or go back or, or what have you. But if you don't, you know, if you don't take that step and try it, yes, you absolutely, I think, can, can get stuck. And so this, um, this, this philosophy of change or taking a risk to move on to the next level is one of your key learnings. Are there any other top two life lessons that you've learned, especially having navigated different titles and different industries? What would you want our young professionals that are watching to know? I mean, I think one thing that's always helped me is to say yes um, to things, uh, to have, you know, it, it's like, it's a, I, I find it odd sometimes when people sort of say, well, that's not, an, that's not my job description or that's not what I do. Um, but looking around mm -hmm. and being curious and finding opportunities, both, you know, within the job that you're already in to kind of you know, push, push the um, boundaries of, of what your job even is. You know, I think if you just sort of go in each day and do the exact same thing the same way, you know, growth doesn't happen as often. So I think being curious about, um, about your job and being curious about the people um, in your job is something that will help people, you know, really move forward. And you never know where something is going to lead you. Like I never knew that, you know, being a camp counselor would help me get my job in television. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So. so how are things going over at Hallmark? I remember and always envision Hallmark as the Hallmark of love and September is National Love Day. And so we're glad to have you encompassing this theme of love, um, including the theme of media in honor of Television um, Day next month. Um, so almost combining the two, it's, it sounds like Hallmark is the uh, epitome of those two coming together as a culmination of both. Um, what do you love about your job here at Hallmark and what, what is it that you, um, you know, wish to do as a next step? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The, you know, the love part, I think, is just pinnacle to the brand itself. You know, as you know, it started um, over 125 years ago as a card company and, yeah. you know, putting with the, yeah, with the idea of putting care into the world. And so, um, you know, to me, the, the brand itself is really an expression of love in all different forms. And it's really enjoyable to be working on a brand that puts that kind of message out into the world of, you know, optimism and hope and joy and love and all different forms of love. And uh, so it's been an amazing experience to, um, you know, I've been working in television for quite a few decades now, and it's nice to be working on a brand that has those attributes in mind. Um, so let's switch gears to television as we're talking about media. Um, what is it that you love about this specific niche or industry um, of media, having gone through different um, careers? What 
specifically um, appeals to you the most? I mean, media encompasses so many different uh, facets, um, from television to books to literature, um, podcasts. You know, it sounds like you're front and center of a big channel. Um, do talk to us a little bit more about that industry for folks that are interested in learning more about that niche and how they can uh, make or break their way into that and um, what's one of the most enthrilling things, a couple of the things to watch out for. We'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, so I think, you know, again, sort of Hallmark as a brand um, is something that I think is unique and different, um, especially during um, COVID and all the things that have, we've been going through, I think as a culture, there's been a lot of stress on our lives to say the least. And this is um, a place that, you know, we have really found, um, you know, the people who are looking to fill a void um, and fill that with hope and optimism and joy and comfort, this is a place they can come. And I enjoy being a part of that for people. We're a little less edgy than a lot of other <laughs> media brands out there, I would say, um, that there's, you know, you're guaranteed a, a positive um, ending in our movies. And I think that that's something um, that, you know, people look forward to. It's, uh, we also, um, we also have a publishing company, uh, Hallmark Publishing, where you can uh, read books and we're doing a lot more work in the podcast uh, space as well. Well, we look forward to that, certainly, to see what, what else is out there. One of the questions our audience has is um, along the lines of media. Media has contributed to societal transformations by putting the spotlight on important topics that the world faces today, from racial injustice to minority rights, etc. cetera. Um, and that all brings us together. Um, any form of media is and always has been the so social glue, but with power comes responsibility. Um, so how do you as a media persona keep your personal views aside and represent the true voice of the people, whether it's for Hallmark or whether it's for Oxygen or TLC or any of the channels you've worked with before? Mm -hmm. Well, I take that responsibility extremely seriously. Um, as saying that we have... Um, that my boss especially drives home and we talk about a lot is that uh, you are not the target audience, meaning I am not the target audience. I am here to serve and super serve my consumers. And uh, especially Hallmark is I've, I have experienced an extremely loyal fan base. Um, these folks know every single movie, every single person that's in the movie. And um, so we want to make sure that um, the things that we're putting out there to them, um, you know, both, uh, exceed their expectations and honor who they are. Um, and, and again, all the attributes that I was talking about earlier, um, you know, even as we continue to try to evolve ourselves, we also as a brand don't want to get stuck, just like we were talking about sort of your own personal self not getting stuck. Mm -hmm. Brands need to also continue to evolve. And, you know, as we do that, um, we take our loyal fan base along with us in our evolution and hope to bring in, you know, new folks to give um, this kind of a brand a try as well. Um, and let's kind of go along the lines of um, the branding aspect um, and talk about marketing a little bit, um, especially mm -hmm. since you are the CMO and you've had this amazing um, ex expertise that you've built over years um, for some of the audiences that are interested in going within, going into the marketing niche or um, understanding how they would navigate the world of marketing. A lot of times sales and marketing is branded together or marketing and branding is um, bundled together. Um, however, marketing within a, in of itself is another um, special niche. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about the world of marketing, um, how things differ, give our not, um, audience a little bit of knowledge, and then also some of the key learnings you learned in your career to get to the point of being the marketing guru you are so we can get inspired from that. Oh, thank you. So, I mean, look, the, the, the world of marketing, even in my short career, has changed so much. I think brands everywhere have um, realized the importance of marketing. Um, I have definitely seen um, brands, you know, outside of entertainment brands, even embrace um, 
you know, various kinds of mediums um, and things to to bring their consumers along. Consumers are a lot more marketing savvy now. Uh, we used to could just sort of say, hey, buy this or watch this. And, and they would kind of come along for the journey. And now I think there's so much content available. There are so many different kinds of products and experiences that people are hit with a, a ton of marketing messages um, in a variety of places. And so as a marketer, it's really important to, to all the things we were talking about to stay true to your brand, uh, to stay true to your audience so that you are um, talking to them in a way that um, that resonates with them and that also um, honors the brand. So uh, to me, that is that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned also when switching brands is to really, you know, not everything, not each formula works for the same brand, um, you know, especially when I was moving from um, TLC to the History Channel, you know, I was doing sort of, you know, cupcakes and weddings and, 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 you know, shows about that kind of content. And then I, you know, moved over to History Channel, which was a completely different thing. So you cannot market um, in the same way, obviously, um, with, with different kinds of brands. So how did you adapt? What, is there any kind of secret sauce or recipe that um, you always go back to any any philosophy that you follow, or is it that you live, you learn, you implement, and execute? That's that's kind of the way to go about it, um, like anything else. Yeah, d yeah, digging in deep into the audience, right? Taking it, getting as much research uh, learnings as you can, and really understanding the audience. Um, you know, one thing I did uh, when I started working for, for Discovery Channel, we had a movie about Harley and the Davidsons, the, the motorcycle. Mm -hmm. I, I am not, I was not a motorcycle person, didn't really know much about motorcycles, but um, part of my experience in digging into the brand and learning how to how to talk about this movie, I actually kind of um, I fell in love a little bit with motorcycles. I ended up getting my motorcycle license and um, and going to the Harley Davidson Riding Academy, which is just something I would have never done. But that's kind of an extreme example of essentially understanding your audience, loving them. Um, you know, finding the things that spark uh, joy for them, uh, finding the things that are interesting to them and, and making sure that you bring it forward. Absolutely. It's like they say with the actors that you really have to live the role um, instead of just playing it. Right. And so I think that's a beautiful. Yeah. Role. Live the brand. <laughs> live the brand, mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. submerge, emerge, you know, submerge yourself into it in order to. Um, truly be successful. I, I think that's a fantastic learning um, that you have provided um, today. Mm -hmm. um, so with that said, I think one of our last questions um, would mm -hmm. be interesting one. So if we were to, if you were to speak your mind without fear of judgment or retaliation, what would you want the world to know? Wow, that is a ginormous question. Um, one thing I will say about myself is I don't often have a hard time speaking my mind. <laughs> I think that's something that I've um, that I have uh, practiced in my both in my personal and professional life. So, you know, nothing nothing really extreme comes to mind. I think that um, except that I would say that you know there is power in the truth. And um, being not being afraid to, you know, speak truthfully with others, to speak truthfully with your consumers, to speak truthfully with your team, all of that is, is really important. And I think we're in a day and age where um, it's hard to know what the truth is. And as they say, there's, I guess there's two or three sides to the truth, but speaking your own truth and I think standing in your own light and communicating things um, in the way in which you truly believe without, just as you're saying, without having fear of retaliation or being able to um, manage that for yourself. In other words, if you, you know, speaking your truth always helps me sleep better at night. I can put mm -hmm. my head down at night knowing, you know, that I've said my truth um, versus trying to, you know, put on a, a face or a show for, um, for others just to, just to keep them comfortable. 
I hope that answers your question. (laughs) Yes, yes. Um, uh, Live your brand, speak your truth, be your authentic self so that it gets poured into your career and personal success. Laura, thank you so much for supporting our series and for being on our show today. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed talking with you. Likewise. Carol Robin, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to be part of 180 Elevate's mission to help people learn how to connect and grow. In this short masterclass, I'll be talking about perhaps the most fundamental building block of connection, which is being open to letting others know you more fully. Relationships exist on a continuum from contact with no connection, or sometimes just plain old dysfunction, all the way to exceptional. Now, nobody's advocating you should aspire to turn every relationship in your life into something exceptional. That would, first of all, be exhausting, and second of all, probably impractical. However, the same skills and competencies that are required in order to move along this continuum towards exceptional are also those that help you create more robust and functional relationships, which is especially important in business since people do business with people, not with machines or ideas or plans or money. They do business with people. And furthermore, interpersonal competence, the ability to create these relationships, is a proven determinant of not only personal success, but professional success. Being known, of course, involves disclosure, and disclosure feels vulnerable. There are many benefits to disclosure and significant costs to non-disclosure. Self-disclosure creates more opportunities to connect as we find out that we have common likes and dislikes and experiences and reactions that we never even knew we shared. It also increases trust. Because if I'm willing to tell you something about me and I trust that you won't use it against me, you are a little bit more likely to reciprocate. The opposite of that and the cost of non-disclosure is what we call progressive impoverishment. The, The closer I hold my cards, the closer you're going to hold yours. And after a while, nobody's going to win in that interaction. And there's one other really big cost to non-disclosure. The less I allow you to know me, the more opportunity I give you to make up stories about me. Because human beings detest a vacuum and they like to make sense of things. Here's what that means in the bottom line. In the absence of data, people will make stuff up. And the less you tell them, the more stuff they'll make up, and it's usually not particularly good. And that's especially true for leaders because uh, people have all kinds of different views and feelings about leaders, and all the more important for us as leaders to be more willing to be more open. Furthermore, when there are power differentials, asking someone else to open up first is really not fair. And so you might want to think about providing a little bit uh, of, of of an opening into who you are in hopes that they will reciprocate. Now, all of that said, you might be sitting there thinking, well, hang on a second, you know, disclosure feels vulnerable and there's a risk, and I want to say yes. Absolutely. Let's talk about that. We all have a comfort zone. Things that we say that we never even think twice about. And we also have a danger zone. Things that we would never in a million years consider sharing or saying to someone else. But it's important to note that we also have this zone in the middle. 
It's called the learning zone. This comes from education research, which says you can't learn anything new unless you step outside your comfort zone. However, uh, before, I, before I leave that topic, let me just, before that point, let me just point out that that's the reason that when you learn to ski, they don't start you on a double black diamond slope, but it's also the reason that they don't leave you on the bunny slope. Now, you might be thinking, however, geez, the minute I get outside my comfort zone, how do I know I'm not in my danger zone? So here's one way to think about it. Think about stepping a little bit outside your comfort zone. We call it 15%. We call this the 15% rule. If you step a little bit outside your comfort zone, you're unlikely, first of all, to freak yourself out or freak the other person out with, with, with TMI. And you're also likely to be taking a judicious risk in terms of whether or not you can trust them. And here's something that happens once you do that. First of all, they're more likely to step 15% outside their comfort zone. And then once you spend a little time in this slightly expanded zone, your comfort zone will redraw. And from there, you can go 15% beyond that. That is how we deepen relationships and begin to learn and grow. I'd like to talk about one particular kind of disclosure uh, that actually helps deepen rela relationships, and that's disclosing feelings, particularly in the here and now. First of all, feelings give meaning to facts. If I tell you I went ziplining, that's a fact. If I tell you I went ziplining and I was elated and exhilarated, you've learned something different. If I tell you I went ziplining and I was terrified and felt coerced, but didn't want to be left behind by my family, which is the actual true story, you've learned a lot more. So feelings and thoughts in communication are like treble and bass in music. Second of all, you know, emotions indicate the importance of something. If I tell you I'm angry, that's different than if I tell you I'm furious or annoyed. If I tell you I'm happy, that's different than if I tell you I'm just absolutely elated. Uh, if I tell you that I'm sad, that's different than I'm devastated. And third, we often create confusion when we don't use feeling words, but use body and tone that's indicating a feeling contrary to what we're saying. How many times have you heard, I'm not angry? So what holds us back from sharing feelings? First of all, some of us don't see ourselves as the touchy-feely type, or we don't think it's okay to admit that we're hurt or express that we're disappointed or angry. Um, that might be something to think about, whether or not you and your relationships are being well served by that. Second of all, we do a strange kind of math, which essentially is, I really like you, you're my good friend, and when you do that, it annoys me, so I say nothing. That's plus five plus minus five equals zero. When it comes to feelings, a better way to think about it is plus five plus minus five equals plus five plus minus five. Feelings that might seem contrary can coexist. Second of all, I mean third of all, we're socialized to be rational, especially in business. Leave your feelings in the parking lot, much to our detriment. I was well into my career 10 years after being hired as the first woman in a non-clerical job at a very large company before I realized that people that didn't before I realized that people didn't see me as human because I never expressed any feelings. I'm not sure I was being particularly well served by that. Fourth of all, sometimes we can't even access our feelings. We don't even know what we're feeling. Um, and so to that extent, you might want to listen to your body a little bit more. Our bodies tend to tell us sometimes before our head allows us to identify a feeling. If you feel a little tingling or your heart starts to race a little more or a pit in your stomach, try paying attention to that a little bit and seeing whether you can identify what's the feeling behind the body sensation. Fifth, we tend to not speak our feelings because they're not permanent. We have to accept that they're not permanent. Just because I'm annoyed with you right now doesn't mean I'm always annoyed with you. Just because I'm 
really disappointed right now. It doesn't mean I'm always disappointed. So you might want to think about, and the more feelings you express in a range, more often, the less likely it is that someone else will get stuck on a particular feeling being what you always feel about them. And last, we don't express feelings because we don't think we're justified. I shouldn't feel hurt. I shouldn't feel angry. You know, allow for the possibility that when it comes to feelings, perhaps they are legitimate in their own right. The only thing you might be wrong about is where you've, uh, where you've assigned blame or the reason for the feeling, but a feeling is a feeling. And the more you start to work with it, the more comfortable you'll get with it. There are different categories of feelings, and I encourage you to think about whether there's one in particular, one category in particular, that's harder for you to express and perhaps experiment with that. To conclude, I'd like to invite you to think about whether you have a relationship you would like to deepen and think about what you could share about yourself that this person would find significant in getting to know you better, and especially your feelings. To learn more about my work, uh, check out my recently published book, Connect, Building Exceptional Relationships with Family, Friends, and Colleagues, based on a, leg a legendary course that my co-author and I taught at Stanford Business School. Or go to our book website, connectandrelate.com, where you'll find free downloadable assessments and activities. Uh, and you can also find out more about the programs offered through my nonprofit, uh, Leaders in Tech, at leadersintech.org. Thanks for listening. Thank you for joining us today and elevating yourself. Charity should begin at home, but should not stay there. At 180 Elevate, it is our honor to support local and global philanthropies, which make an impact on the lives of our beautiful children and the world in of itself. What would this world look like if we all felt cared for? Let's co-create that new paradigm. If you would like to consider joining our philanthropic mission, please consider donating at 180elevate.com. And next is just a glimpse into one of the many philanthropies our organization supports. The Caleb and Calder Sloan's Awesome Foundation is a nonprofit charity focused on helping disadvantaged children, empowering kids to pay it forward themselves. I'm glad that everybody is doing this. My brother Calder, he was the light in my heart. We'll live a million lives, but our hearts still beat like one. I love you. I'm gonna give you a book out of there. For seven short but beautiful years, Calder Jacob Sloan taught all those around him about love and joy. Uh... Young Calder died just seven days after his seventh birthday, electrocuted while swimming. Mr. Awesome, they called him Calder Jacob Sloan. You lose a child after seven years. It's so short and unfair that you want to create a legacy. And although tragedy took his young life. This little boy, I tell you, he packed a lot of life into his short seven years. His mission to change the world has only begun. Calder was a unique kid and we called him Mr. Awesome because the lesson I think that he taught all of us when he was alive was that he really was about kindness. A Florida boy nicknamed Mr. Awesome has become the focus of a global campaign to share his smile and uplifting spirit. Going viral in the form of his colorful self-portrait. His soaring spirit continues to help others. Captain Calder, Mr. Awesome Sloan are on the side of this 727. I really miss him, and I think this brings out the happiness for him. It started by saving lives, changing pool regulations. Miami-Dade and Broward passed ordinances to make new pools safer. And in just a few years, the foundation has built an awesome track record of social cause events educational programs, exhibitions, and installations all over America, including an annual Give Back Day in South Florida. We're doing a Give Back Day. Uh, this is our third time doing this by helping 
other schools. Every year, his family, friends, and some volunteers get together and give back to the community in his honor. The foundation was quick to assist in responding to the historic disaster in Puerto Rico by collecting and delivering disaster relief supplies with Operation Puerto Rico Care Lift. And when the holidays came, the children of Puerto Rico were not forgotten. Children in Puerto Rico, a passion to help them, led to Operation Puerto Rico Gift Lift, a hurricane relief toy drive that has already filled up multiple airplanes. In Sunday in Aguadilla, a giant party for anyone who needed it. And wouldn't you know, the whole town came out. And we've teamed up with Promax DBA to create the annual House of Awesome event for three years packing thousands of backpacks in NYC and LA for underprivileged kids, teaming up with Hashtag Lunch Bag to provide for the homeless, and even brought the House of Awesome to corporate events like Tegna Broadcasting. During the COVID-19 has met its match campaign, it matched individual donations, raising $120,000 from over 250 donors, hospitals, and first responder organizations on the front lines fighting COVID-19 across America. We have the need to feed. Our awesome grocery giveaways are tackling the food insecurity crisis head on, distributing thousands of thousands of groceries with 10 events and counting all over South Florida. Key West hosted a drive through for their residents. Miami Children's Museum partnering with Caleb and Calder Sloan's awesome foundation to lend a helping hand. We're in Miami Beach helping to feed 500 families today. We have orange juice, USDA chicken, and all these beautiful fresh cut flowers. I'm very happy to give the food. Thank you, Thank for, you the food. for the food. Appreciate you coming. We're live in Tamarack, a long line because of a big need. In New Orleans, providing food for 900 families. And Connecticut. The Connecticut Food Bank worked with the Caleb and Calder Sloan Awesome Foundation, and they expect to distribute food to 1,500 households. Oh, yeah. And this year, House of Awesome came home to Miami as the foundation packed thousands of backpacks for inner city school kids, grades K through 12, for the amazing Overtown Youth Center. We have a celebration going on. We kick it off today with these incredible backpacks of supplies. I'm graduating! You know, it's just nice to start the school year off fresh. Yeah, that looks like a party out there. We graduated! I graduated! Awesome! The best is yet to come. And the foundation partnered with Miami Heat superstar Alonzo Mourning and the Overtown Youth Center in sponsoring the 33 awesome Thanksgiving giveaway, providing meals for 300 families. Thank you, everybody, and happy Thanksgiving for you. By working with our partners and our supporters who open their hearts, hands, and checkbooks. You've been making a difference in the lives of children and their families with adventure, laughter, and kindness. And we've only just begun. Caleb and Calder Sloan's Awesome Foundation. Unleash your awesome.